Tonight's panel consists of a diverse group of women who have confronted unique challenges and navigated through a complex landscape to create paths of success. They have excelled in their respective fields and opened doors for others. The moderator for this esteemed panel, Not So Hidden Figures, is going to be moderated by Kim Macharia, who's the executive director of the Space Prize Foundation and also serves as the chair of the Space Frontier Foundation. And she may tell you and try to diminish and be very super humble about all of her accomplishments, but make no doubt, with a blend of strategic vision, a knack for impactful messaging, and an unwavering commitment to outreach, she continues to push boundaries, challenge conventions, and inspire new generations to look towards the stars with wonder, curiosity, and ambition. Her work is more than a profession. It is a calling that invites all of us to make our space diverse. Please welcome to the stage. Come on out, you guys. Oh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Janet. Hi, everyone. We are so thrilled to be here to talk about uh, the significance of bringing more diverse voices into the space economy. So today before you, we have an incredible panel filled with some brilliant women who are truly out here shaking up the world and making an incredible difference. So we are in for an exciting conversation. My name is Kim Asharia. As Janet mentioned, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Space Prize. And I entered the space industry about five years ago. And when I entered the industry, it was actually to specifically become a diversity and inclusion advocate in the sector. I had a screenwriting fellowship for a couple of years where I would get funding to do ethnographic research on American values. And my last script happened to be inspired by a space camp jacket I got from a thrift store. And next thing I know, I wrote a musical comedy about two women competing for a free trip to space. And when I was doing my research for these characters, they were these immigrant young women. I came to really understand the inequities that existed in the space sector and made it my mission to try and change that. And it's been a fun journey ever since. And one of the best parts of the work that I get to do is meeting incredible women like the ones we have before us on this stage here today. So without further ado, I want to get them to introduce themselves to you. So let's kick things off with Dr. Cyan Proctor, inspiration for astronaut and mission pilot, a woman who is truly out here trying to make a difference in the world, inspiring the next generation to believe that they can reach the stars if they so choose to. So Cyan, let's kick things off with you. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. And, you know, um, Inspiration4 really changed my life. And when I think about um, diversity and inclusion, and we're talking about the first all commercial um, mission to orbit, I look at the fact that uh, I was aboard as the oldest of the crew. Um, we, we, you know, we had four different uh, decades. Haley was in her 20s. Um, Chris, in, oh, Jared in his 30s, Chris in his 40s, and me in my 50s. So we spanned almost 30 years. But also thinking about my crew member Haley as the um, a childhood cancer survivor. And so those of you that don't, I have some slides, I believe. And so those of you that um, may not have remembered or watched Inspiration 4, this is an idea, this will give you an intro into what happened with us. The reason I started SpaceX was to get humanity to Mars. We want to try to make the dream of space accessible to anyone, and ultimately making science fiction not fiction forever. What they're about to do will change the game entirely. Four civilians are going to space. They will orbit the Earth for three days on their own. You know, my dream of always wanting to go to space. I wanted to let you know that I got selected. <laughs> they start telling me about this all civilian mission to space. How many astronauts are going? And that's when she said, none. Haley was diagnosed with bone cancer. I haven't died and I'm not going to die. Having cancer made me who I am. My dream is to be a nurse. I'm getting to show them what their life can look like after cancer. If I can do it, you can definitely do it. I went upstairs after the phone call though and told my wife, I think I'm gonna ride a rocket. And she just 
What? I don't think I'll think about the worldly impact this mission is going to have until Chris is back on the ground. I'm like, why would they choose me? Look at that. But my dad had instilled this idea in me that I could do anything. I'm commander of Inspiration 4. No matter what, I'm a father first, and that comes with a great deal of responsibility. What is the speed? You know, 25 times the speed of sound, or 17 and a half thousand miles an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's getting real. Our mission to space had to serve a bigger purpose, which is why it's a $200 million fundraising campaign for the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. There have been three black female American astronauts who have made it to space. I will be number four. Start thinking about what could happen and the risks that are involved. These people are you and me. And they will kick the doors open to space for the rest of us. This is where we're going to live for three days. Home sweet home. Who here wants to go to space? <laughs> And so that whole idea of, you know, when Elon says, the, you know, the goal is to open up space for everyone and how important that is. Um, and being part of Inspiration4, I really feel like that was the, the, a big opening to that door and that dream. Um, and, but it really radically changed my life because after Jared said, you know, you are, you're going to go, he said, um, and I want you to be the mission pilot. And so um, I still have more to my slides, so I'm gonna put up this next. Um, and so this is me and my story. The day of launch, I'm going to be thinking about how my entire life has led up to this moment. I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there is that my dad worked for the NASA tracking station. And so I feel like space has always been a part of me. When I got that, call that zoom and jared was on there and he said that you know they picked me for the prosperity seat that i was going to go to space with him uh, and be part of the inspiration for it really was like um getting the golden ticket for willy wonka everything in my life finally came into focus and i realized that it was all about this moment in time I won the prosperity seat for Inspiration4, and I did that not as a geoscientist or an explorer or an analog astronaut, which are all on my resume. I actually won this as a poet and an artist. We are striving for that Star Trek generation, that idea of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space or a Jedi space. I'm gonna be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft ever. And to me, that just blows me away. And I want to encourage the next generation to dream that this is possible. And a Jedi space, that's what that's about. I'm Dr. Cyan Proctor, and I'm the mission pilot for Inspiration4. To go, <laughs> to go from being born on Guam and my dad being a hidden figure um, during the Apollo missions to now being able to fly to space and to bring Neil Armstrong's autograph thanking my dad for what he did on Guam and, and then to be able to also paint in space. Um, those are just some of the highlights of this journey that I've been on. But the most important thing is the fact that we are really trying, it's, we've got to be intentional about creating a Jedi space, that just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space for all of humanity. Um, and, and for me, thinking about that we stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. And when I think of that legacy, I think about going back to the pioneers of aviation that led the way and Bessie Coleman and the fact that she could not get her pilot's license here in the United States. In 1921, she went to France um, became, to become the first um, black female to earn her pilot's license. And then it was 100 years later that I became the first African-American woman to pilot a spacecraft. But we can't let history um, be forgotten in the legacy of those who have paved the way. Thank you.
Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that message, Cyan. And I think the, the legacy of these hidden figures that you, you briefly just mentioned, um, I find it invaluable because right now we're, we're watching uh, the fruits of their labor come to life in the most incredible of ways. And with that, I want to introduce Vanessa White, who I believe is the highest ranked black woman within NASA, which is not <laughs> uh, something to scoff at. Um, she is able to have this position because of the work of those who came before her. And so I'm, I'm so excited to bring out Vanessa White to share a bit about her work at NASA. Thank you, thank you so much. And it is uh, my honor to be on this uh, panel with all of you. Um, just uh, super proud uh, to, to be a part of this. I, I do also just have just a couple of uh, slides. Um, so if we could maybe just even go to the first one. Uh, so, you know, I was truly inspired uh, by a science presentation. Uh, I grew up a, a young girl in South Carolina, uh, very interested in uh, science, always wanted to see how things worked, lots of curiosity. And uh, so for me, um, I was not uh, in a, a school system uh, that at that time had like a technology program, et cetera. Uh, so when I went off to college it was actually when I found out about engineers and what engineers could do and found my passion. Uh, so I have uh, received an undergraduate and then a graduate degree in engineering. And uh, from there, uh, went on to uh, wanting to understand really how how uh, the body uh, works and how we can actually make changes to it. Fortunate for me, uh, I was able to uh, work here at NASA and specifically at NASA's Johnson Space Center uh, where our main focus is human space exploration. And um, had uh, many jobs. I, I started as a project engineer building hardware uh, to put uh, uh, on uh, shuttle missions, looking at how astronauts uh, perform in microgravity, um, how we can actually help them to thrive in space. At Johnson Space Center, uh, I have the pleasure of leading 11,000 people. Uh, and that is our focus every day is for safe uh, human space flight. And uh, so we have our astronauts that most people know that, they know we have our flight controllers, we have mission control, uh, but we do training, uh, we do mission planning, but we also do mission design. Uh, and I had the pleasure, the young man that was there before, um, the organization that he supports at Johnson Space Center is um, where we do our exploration, architecture, uh, integration and science. And uh, so the planning for the missions to Moon and to Mars. And so building and working towards uh, going to Mars for, with humans for some time, uh, doing research, uh, using the International Space Station for our human research, as well as um, technology uh, to make sure that we have the capabilities to sustain ourselves on those missions. Right now, today, uh, we have something very exciting. I thought I would just highlight a couple of things that are, are going on, uh, which have to do with one, a ground analog, where we're going to be simulating a one-year mission to Mars. And then also, um, we're very excited about receiving the samples that we're going to get back uh, from uh, Perseverance. Uh, so many of you may know that um, right now, today, Perseverance is on Mars and it's collecting samples, and those samples are scheduled uh, to be returned to Earth on a uncrewed uh, robotic mission. And when those samples uh, come back, uh, they'll be a part of a collection of extraterrestrial samples that we have here at the Johnson Space Center, including samples from Apollo. And we're very much looking forward to the new samples that we'll be getting from Artemis. If you, yeah, so here should be a video that's going to play. Uh, and that is uh, showing you uh, the development of the CHAPIA, um, which stands for Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog. Uh, and it was built, it's a 3D built habitat. Um, and so this video is showing you how it was, uh, how it was built. And then I think it will go on to actually show you some of the outfitting of the Chapia itself. Um, the 
mission, as I said, will be one year and uh, we will have uh, crew members that will go inside for us to actually study the impact of um, health, which includes nutrition. And there we go. And I was just making sure the slide was advancing. Nutrition as well as um, we've, no we've learned a lot um, over our 60 years of uh, space flight of understanding the impacts of um, nutrition on our health and I now I can't actually see the slides that are advancing in the room so I'm just make sure they're just going and I'll keep going <laughs> and so um, but with that uh, we will also understand the behavioral impacts of what it's like uh, the, right, you should be seeing right now it will be the first four crew members uh, that have been selected uh, for um, this one year simulated mission. And then they actually have uh, two people that are their backups. That is here at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and we have it such that we can, I think the previous uh, presentation talked about like time delays, things that you would have as a part of going on a Mars mission. All of that will be uh, simulated as we are doing Chapia. Uh, I'm not sure if the other slide is up yet. It should have been on astromaterials research, but um, showing the uh, facilities uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. There, there you go. Uh, and so uh, what we're just trying to depict for you here is, you know, this is the campus. Um, the majority of it is centered around human spaceflight, but we do have a science cadre and specifically one that focuses on astromaterials. If you click the slide again, uh, this yeah shows you all of the different materials that we have here and what we're looking forward to uh, coming forward into the future. Um, right now, we're very excited. We're gonna be getting uh, samples from OSIRIS-REx, which is, is an asteroid, and that should be coming here in September. Uh, but we've been planning for uh, the return of the samples from Perseverance, and we will have uh, those samples along with the collection that I already mentioned. You can see those across the top of the screen. And this is helping us to um, learn about life on other planets, but it also teaches us about our own planet uh, as we study these materials. You hit the next slide. And this shows you, it may already be up there. Sorry, I couldn't actually see the slides. Okay, so, um, but that one was to talk about the Mars, the actual campaign itself. Um, and with that, uh, I, that was all I was gonna highlight and look forward uh, to the panel discussion. Thank you so much for sharing about all the incredible work you guys are doing at the Johnson Space Center to push humanity's mission to get to Mars forward. In order to have that future come to life, we are going to need a lot of people here on Earth supporting that mission. And so I want to introduce Dr. Quincy K. Brown, Director of Space STEM and Workforce Policy at the National Space Council, to share a bit about what she's doing to ensure that we are ready for that future. Thank you. I, I have no slides. I have no video. Uh, I, for some reason, I thought going after all of these presentations would be would be great. But now I'm feeling like I should have gone should have gone before. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with this amazing panel and with you all to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at the National Space Council. So we are a. Um, I'll say small but mighty team. We're a policy council in the executive office of the president responsible for providing um, him with advice on um, the design, implementation, and, and space-related strategy. Um, the Vice President, um, Kamala Harris, is chair of the National Space Council, so she is our boss, and we sit within her office, in the office of the Vice President. Uh, we have directors for um, commercial, civil, national security, and international space uh, policy, and I am, I guess, one of the newest directors. This role that I have did not exist in previous iterations of the Space Council, where I focus on STEM education and workforce um, for, for space. Um, our council is comprised of the heads of departments and agencies across the federal government, and so we do a lot of coordination um, and thinking about, and in my role in particular, uh, thinking about how we are, as Kim mentioned, preparing uh, people 
to do all of the work and enable all of the work um, and innovate and create uh, the things that, that don't even exist yet, right? How are we, how are we thinking about supporting people in, that, in their education and preparation now for things that don't exist in the future that are going to be vitally needed right, and important. So that's the work that I do um, in the, um, as part of the Space Council. And really, I am thinking about not just how space, uh, I like to say space for Earth, right? There's space for space exploration and, and all of that's been discussed. But really, there's so much that happens in space that is relevant to communities, to people, individuals here today on Earth. And so making also making sure that while we're preparing people, we're using um, the, we're using, um, you know, using the awesomeness of space to inspire them, right? To continue on this journey to get to wherever, the, wherever, whenever they land, right? Wherever they are, however long it takes for them to get there, that we're using the awesomeness of space to do that, and also making sure that we are creating a workplace uh, that is inclusive and diverse and supportive of people, so that you know, once they arrive there, they can stay and have long, thriving careers. So my role is really focused on, I say, K to gray, um, and thinking about all. All, all of it, um, and so at times it feels like I'm boiling the ocean, but I think it's really important that we are doing this and being intentional, as was mentioned, right, and thoughtful about how we are building this um, space enterprise so that we don't look up, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years and wish we had done things differently. Thank you so much. We haven't even gotten to the questions yet, and I'm already inspired, y'all. All right, so let's kick things off with talking about uh, y'all's journey into the space sector. If you guys, has anyone, most of y'all seen the movie Hidden Figures, right? Incredible film. It does a wonderful job at spotlighting the contribution of women whose voices weren't previously spotlighted as, uh, as the space race was just beginning. And so I'd love to hear about uh, how you all specifically got into space. Most people tend to have some unconventional journeys. I don't think there's one straight path into this exciting sector. So let's kick things off with you, Sai Ann. How did your journey begin? You know, my journey began on Guam with my dad as a hidden figure. You know, he didn't have, neither of my parents had college degrees. My dad taught himself uh, mathematics um, and then ended up being able to work for a NASA contractor uh, and from 1966 to 1970, he was on Guam at the tracking station specifically for the Apollo missions there. Uh, and and I, when I was born, I'm a, a moon celebration baby, so I was born eight and a half months after Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. So, uh, so I feel like space is, is part of my blood there. But my family left, my dad left working for that contractor and um, we moved away couple months after I was born, and, but I grew up with all of this NASA memorabilia on my dad's wall, including the Neil Armstrong autograph. And, and I just remember as a kid just um, wanting to go and be a fighter pilot and then an astronaut because, you know, it was all about the right stuff back then. And the right stuff was, you know, it was white male. Um, and I didn't realize that as a kid because, you know, as a kid, we, we, don't, we don't see that. But my parents did an amazing job of not, um, not saying, one, there's no female fighter pilots <laughs> and that there are no black female astronauts. As a kid, I just didn't know that. And they instead fueled this love of my dad would take me to the model rocket store and, and, um, and to the uh, buy model airplanes. And then he found the Civil Air Patrol for me. But like a lot of us, who wanted to be an astronaut when you were five years old or 10 years old? And, and, but those dreams slip away. And for me, that's what happened. You know, my dad passed away when I was 19, so I lost that kind of like champion. And, um, and then I got glasses. And I thought, wow, if I got glasses, then I'll never be a, a military aviator. And if I'm never going to be a military aviator, I'm never going to be a NASA astronaut. And so these, these narratives in our head kind of like change our careers in interesting ways. Um, but I'd always had this love of space, so I was always still chasing it in the background, even though I went on to become a geoscientist. Um, and then, and then it, life comes, has a way of bringing things back full circle. Um, in, in, in my late 30s, somebody said, NASA's looking for astronauts, you should apply. And I was like, what? You know, I can apply. Wait, okay, let me figure this out. And I got down to the yes/no phone call in 2009 um, 
as a, you know, for the NASA astronaut selection process, it was a heartbreaking no, but then how do you move yourself forward because you've got to figure out when you have these setbacks, they're really not setbacks, they're kind of like just trajectory changes. Um, and you learn to celebrate those moments in ways that help you propel to propel yourself forward. So I became an analog astronaut living in moon and Mars simulations. So I can uh, relate to the uh, Chapua uh, Chapia crew, crew that's going in because in 2013, a decade ago, I did my first analog mission that was funded by NASA and it was four months living in the high seas habitat, investigating food strategies for long duration space flight. And that kind of like kept me going because I thought if I can't, if I wasn't going to be an astronaut, you know, advancing human space flight up there, I could be, I could still advance human space flight here on Earth as an analog astronaut. And then lo and behold, Inspiration4 came along. And, and all of those dreams and all of that preparation of trying to make myself flight ready came to fruition. And now it's about with great opportunity comes great responsibility and help making sure that that door that has been opened um, stays opened. It seems like your journey was significantly you know, impacted by advancements in the space sector, especially when we're looking at the commercial side for sure. So Vanessa, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the industry has changed since you began your career, especially you know, in relation to, to some of the things Cyan has mentioned as part of her journey. Awesome, and uh, thank you Cyan for sharing, sharing your journey. And, um, and also talking about how you know, we have to see things as not being a setback, but something that propels us to go forward. Yeah, I have um, a uh, over 30 year career uh, in uh, the space industry. And uh, so a lot has changed. Uh, I will tell you that when I first started my, my career, specifically uh, in the uh, branch that uh, I was in, which was, uh, our life sciences projects branch, which was um, kind of a, uh, a core branch for developing hardware. On the technical side, um, I was the only black female. Uh, there were very few, few women, period. And um, then, you know, looking around the industry itself, uh, the, the leadership uh, on the technical side, um, there, there was no um, representation of uh, people that were uh, what you would consider to be women, minorities, et cetera. Uh, and so a lot has changed. I will tell you that the movie Hidden Figures, um, especially for me, uh, it was um, so important. You know, when we were, somebody was mentioning, I think maybe Cyan was talking about, uh, you know, history and how you should not hide history because it, it does impact um, how people can see themselves. Uh, but when the movie Hidden Figures came out, especially at, at centers other than at Langley, I do understand that people in the uh, local Hampton, Virginia area uh, were familiar with the story because uh, this is, ba and it was based on real people. Some people, you know, <laughs> don't believe that it was based on real people. Margot Shetterly did this as a, as a part of a research project. Uh, these, and so she went back, if you go and you read the actual, uh, her writings, um, there were many women, there were many men uh, that were not ever documented and highlighted. People like Cyan's father. Um, and so, since that movie came out, I will tell you that so many people have come forward that maybe worked for IBM uh, on uh, those first mainframes that you see in that, the movie Hidden Figures. NASA has a great archive, and when the movie came out, myself and some other uh, females here um, at the center went and we looked through the archives, and there they were. There were all these women that were human computers. Uh, women that moved from Langley to the Johnson Space Center as we um, stood up the Johnson Space Center. It was so very empowering to know that I was not alone. I was not the only person. There had been people that had done this years before, but that empowerment was not familiar because it was, it was hidden. 
And so um, the industry has changed. Now, you know, I look at this esteemed panel, I look at the opportunities that are available to so many of us, and I agree with uh, Cyan. So, you know, knowing that and where we are, I, it is a responsibility to make sure that our story is told so that other people can look and they can say, wow, if Vanessa can do that, I can do that too. Um, so, sorry, I got a little bit off tangent, but the, yeah, the industry <laughs> has, has changed quite a bit. And, and not only I would, you know, say um, in those ways, but in the ways that we're able to, um, to work together. Uh, when I first uh, started, we were working with um, the German space agencies. Um, we were working uh, with the Canadian space agencies. Um, I do, and we, you know, remember, you know, Mae Jameson as the first uh, African American female to go into space. Uh, her that mission was about 31 or so years ago, and so working with the Japanese. Japanese space agency. Uh, and now we're expanding and working with people all around the world and with Artemis just bringing in so many more people into space. And with the commercial space uh, sector expanding and growing um, with suborbital flights, you know, there's so many more people that will get to have the experience that Scion had of going into space as we continue to evolve. I love that you spotlighted the importance of collaboration. Quincy, although your entry into space has been more recent than Vanessa's, you have made some incredible impact quite quickly. And it's a lot of it seems to be through collaboration and, and bringing together key stakeholders. So what project are you most proud to have worked on so far? Um, I, so I'll, I'll say, as you mentioned, I am uh, a relative newcomer to space. I've been here uh, officially seven months. Uh, but yeah, it's very new. Uh, I will, I will um, unashamedly admit that I have zero desire to go into space. I get sick. I don't, do, I don't even do roller coasters. So but I, I appreciate and respect all that Cyan has, has accomplished um, and the people who raised their hands about wanting to be an astronaut. That was not my story. Um, and the more that I learn and the more I see, the more terrified I am of like even you know, going higher than I can jump. Um, but, I, but I do think that you know, what, what Vanessa mentioned, what Cyan mentioned, is really important about who gets to be part of this, right? And I think, you know, I, I said to someone yesterday, you know, can you imagine if there had been women who landed on the moon, what we might know more about the human body, right? What, what we might have been able to learn and discover if just there was someone of a different gender, right, 60 years ago. Um, and so I think about, you know, the, the, the humanity part of this and the fact that it does require partnerships, it does take um, you know, countries working together, individuals, organizations working together to achieve more than any one of us can do you know, individually. And so I think you know, the, the project that I'm most proud of is kind of the one that I've been, <laughs> that I've been working on, um, but it really is our Space STEM initiative and because that is about, um, it's about the people. Right? It's about ensuring that um, you know, everyone um, has an opportunity to contribute to the space enterprise and also benefit from the space enterprise. So what we're learning, all of the work that Vanessa mentioned, benefits you know, all, all of humanity. Right? The work that Cyan has done and is continuing to do um, is inc includes everyone. And that I see some young people here, and I'm sure there's some young people, or younger than me people, um, you know, that, that, they, that they can see themselves in it and know that it really is an opportunity for them to contribute in whichever way that they want, right? I mean, it's not just about being an astronaut, which is awesome, but not everyone has that desire. There's, you know, we talked about food, health, nutrition, right? All of these people who have interests, um, seamstresses, people who are creating the, you know, the suits, people who are building the habitats, right? There's a place, we could say a place for a place in space. So everyone has a place in space and an opportunity to contribute, but the paths have to be there. And so that's the part of my work that I'm most proud of is, a, is really highlighting the fact that we have to make these more explicit uh, and more visible to the people because it shouldn't be you know, happenstance, right, that someone um, is able to find their way into this enterprise. We should make it very easy and very intentional that people can be here and contribute. Absolutely. And 
One thing I do see people struggle with at times is you know, the need to find community and support when you're taking on such heavy responsibilities as, as each of you are. And so I want to throw this out to the group. Where have you been able to find support and community in order to feel confident in championing, championing your mission forward? I'll, I'll start, I mean, I'll say right here on this stage, I guess Vanessa's, in, you know, and virtually in this, on the stage with us, I mean, I've, I've come to know her um, and see her, um, you know, often, and, and last time I saw her, you know, we had a brief exchange that meant a lot to me. Uh, oh, I shouldn't have done on my mic, sorry. But it, but it really did mean, it, it, it meant a lot to me, and earlier today, similar with Cyan, she was, you know, Few people say, like, how are you doing? People ask me, how's the work? How's the projects? But, you know, it, these are people, and, and even Kim have said, you know, like, how are you? And I think that is really, really important and one that is, again, we, we talk about doing all this work for the sake of humanity. Um, you know, it's important that we take care of, of each other, of the people who are here. And so that's that's one thing I can say is just, you know, meeting some, some really amazing uh, men and women um, who have been able to really take an interest um, and a genuine interest in me as a person, um, not just the work that I, that I do. So I think that's been really, really meaningful and impactful for me. Uh, yeah, you know, for me, I think the, the community aspect is so important. And um, when we're trying to think about Jedi space, it's not outer space, it's this space. It's the space we inhabit. How do we make a Jedi space for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for our schools? for the entire planet and then beyond. And, and so um, reaching out in ways that you didn't think of before, the pandemic forced us to like reevaluate um, the way we kind of do things and, and how we connect to people. And social media became a big part of that. And so for me, I wouldn't have been able to go to space, the prosperity seat. You know, I tell people I won a Twitter contest. You know, it literally was a Twitter contest, but to have, the, the community around me um, rally on social media for, to be able to be elevated to the point where um, I got selected. Uh, and then thinking about you know, um, when, uh, what happened to George Floyd and um, Black Lives Matters during the pandemic and, and then moving forward into different spaces where um, uh, African-American and people of color's voices began to be elevated in ways that hadn't been before through social media um, and thinking about that ripple effect that happened. And then thinking for me, like, you know, how do we get active allies in, in support of creating Jedi space? And, and looking at, I looked at myself and I realized that on Twitter, I, I, my, I wasn't following a diverse group of people. And, and so I was like, oh, well, there's all of these now hashtags, black and astro, you know, black and in all of these different spaces. And so I went through and intentionally started reaching out and, and making community um, for myself. And, and that's one of the things where I think we can all think about how diverse is our network? Are we creating that Jedi space? Like, um, what can I do right now to make a difference? And, and one of them is, it's easy. Social media, diversify. Um, get out there and start mingling in other groups that you normally wouldn't um, and, and trying to be supportive in those spaces and build community that goes beyond what your norm is already. I think that's so important. Absolutely. And Vanessa, yeah, was can there I anything just like add that? one? Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, the, the um, point about um, mentor, mentorship, you know, for, for each of us to, to reach out and, and mentor others to help them um, because, you know, uh, sometimes there will be difficult times. There are going to be things that are challenges, et cetera, that uh, others may face that you've already gone through. And so mentoring and sharing that out. Uh, but I, I, I love this question uh, because, you know, what we do and uh, is something that requires connectivity. Nobody goes into space by themselves. Doesn't happen. <laughs> and it requires people working together to make that happen. And so having that sense of teamwork, of camaraderie, of really, you know, I am my sister's keeper in this case is so very important. 
Absolutely, and I think we all you know, do our best in our positions to try and push that ideal forward. Uh, Quincy, I wanna come back to you. How are, how are you specifically trying to leverage your position to drive change in the industry right now? So I think, you know, obviously being, being in the White House, you know, carries, I think was mentioned, a certain amount of responsibility, but I think it's an opportunity to also, uh, for me personally, because I'm a relative newcomer to space, to bring in my experiences, uh, my background is in electrical engineering, computer science, um, and so I, I've seen, you know, and, and are aware of the change over time of, say, we talked about the hidden figures, the human computers, right, the gender shifts in, in the computing um, discipline, right, in the computing world, right? And so it's, it's an opportunity to kind of think about how to use the lessons of the past um, and bring them into the space industry in a way that can um, get us to what you call the Jedi, uh, you know, this Jedi environment uh, without having to relive the past. And so um, being able to be in this position, I think, is a privilege. Um, it gives me an opportunity to say some things um, in a, in a, on a platform that you know, people listen to in a way that, you know, they, they didn't, you know, a few years ago uh, when I was not in the administration. And I think it also um, highlights, you know, as I mentioned, the vice president is, is the chair of the Space Council. She is the first, you know, woman vice president, right? The first person of color to have her seat. And so I think she is also uniquely positioned to um, understand the importance of the collaborations, the importance of all of us needing to be there and how we do this in a just and equitable way, given her background right in, in, in her legal background and so I think that's kind of the way that I see all these pieces coming together um, in the first space and although we don't all have the opportunity to have that kind of influence when it comes to the development of the space sector we can certainly all be doing things as individuals to push this vision forward so Cyan what would you tell our audience like what are ways that we can actively work towards incorporating Jedi principles into the space industry as individuals uh, well, I think the, one of them is that, that social media part of reaching out um, and getting connected. Uh, I think the, we all have um, ways in which we can use our, our, our space to inspire um, and the seat that we have at the table to think about how to open up access and to create that Jedi space. Um, and, and so I think that that's one of the things is that once you start putting yourself in that mindset of, of Jedi and being like, I'm going to be a Jedi. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be a Jedi? It's a Star Wars theme with a, a Star Trek uh, meaning behind it, right? So you get both, you know? Um, but that whole idea of like, well, okay, you know, where, what is it in my space that I can make an impact in this way. And maybe it's, you know, running a conference and saying like, okay, when I look at the conference, how do I make this conference a Jedi space? What would that look like? What would that mean? Um, and a lot of times having conversations within your, your space about Jedi, because it's not, it's not about one person deciding what a Jedi space looks like. We need the community to decide. And so it's getting people together and saying, okay, we're, we're, we're in this space together. What would this space, uh, what does it mean for this space to be just? What does it mean for this space to be um, equitable? What does it mean to be diverse? And what does it mean to be inclusive for us as a community? Um, because it has to be community led in order for it to be successful. Not agree more. And Vanessa, high level executives across the industry highly regard you and you get to work with them in a variety of ways. And I'm sure you've seen folks take unique approaches to making the industry more inclusive. So what positive steps forward do you feel like the industry is presently taking? And if you wanted, if you could have a room full of these folks, you know, together, what would you tell them in order to help them take things to the next level? Yeah, you know, I, I um, will say, um, I think the industry has uh, embraced um, the principles of the, the Jedi principles, right? And, you know, a part of it is, what are we doing because it's the right thing to do? But also, what are we doing because, quite honestly, because our industry is growing, it is expanding so fast, we have to have everyone come to work every day and be their full and complete selves. And we need to bring in more people, right? 
we have to, as Quincy is saying, the work that she's doing of bringing more folks into STEM fields. It, it, I mean, we, it absolutely is necessary, right? So with that, um, I do see that, you know, industry is trying to make sure that we are uh, embracing what are the principles for making sure that we're expanding recruitment. Uh, how do we work together, government, industry, academia, on you know reaching out and making sure that everyone can see themselves as being a part of this workforce? And uh, I love, like Quincy said, you know when you think about space, people oftentimes think about the technical side, but you know we need we need lawyers, we need you know we need accountants. There's communication specialists. There's so many jobs that are required. Um, so I do see that our executive leadership across the uh, industry is, is pushing and making sure that we're going out and we're recruiting together. Uh, the other part of that, though, is the, uh, you know, inclusive. How, how do we do that? Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, different um, industry partners, whether, whether they be quote unquote, you know, commercial space, whether they're government, et cetera. And um, everyone has some form of inclusive councils, right? Where there are what we call employee resource groups, where uh, there are people of certain affinities where you can get together and say, you know, in this particular space, I can talk about things that maybe I can't talk about in other groups. And then the other big thing, though, I will say is the understanding and the appreciation of allies. How do we encourage allies? And that is the way to get to that whole point of, I want to do the right thing. I want to be your ally. I want to help everyone to be successful. Uh, but I do see, um, you know, because we just have a strong need uh, to increase our workforce, that um, we have to we have to apply these Jedi principles in order for us to be successful. I could not agree with that anymore. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I would like to give anyone the chance. You might have a question for this incredible group of women, the chance to to hop onto the mic. So if you have any questions, feel free to hop over to the mic. Um, but Quincy, I want to bring things back to you. You. Uh, as Vanessa mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities coming up in the safe sector, but there are a number of barriers as well to folks being fully able to leverage those opportunities. So what barriers do you feel like need to be addressed right now? So I think there, there's some with regard to um, um, education, right? I think there's, well, let me, let me take a step back. I think one of them uh, coming, coming from, a, a, I'll say, a space outsider is just awareness. Right, I think not enough people, and, and I'll, I'll admit that I didn't really know all that space is um, and can be. Um, the space community is small and a little insular, and you know there's so much amazing um, work and benefits of space um, for today and the future that I don't think enough people know about what what it is. And so, and I al always think about um, you know how how to communicate. Um, about the work that you all are doing and why it matters to people outside of the space community. And so I think that to me is a, is a very big barrier just at the beginning because people haven't thought about it, right? I hadn't thought about it, um, not because it's, it didn't matter, I just didn't, didn't think about it. Um, so I think that's one of the pieces. But then, you know, having an awareness is one thing, right? Being able to understand what the path is, having the path be visible, um, clearly articulated so that people understand, you know, even if I want to be an astronaut, like what do I actually have to do to be an astronaut? It, it's kind of fuzzy, right? I mean, there's some people who know, but I don't think as many, for as many people who want to do it, not enough people know. Right? Or if you want to contribute to building a habitat, what exactly do I need to know? Like, what does that mean? And so I think making, you know, uh, demystifying a lot of what happens in space. Many people think that what's going on in space is secret, that they don't know because they're not allowed to know, and that's also not true. And so I think there's just a general awareness piece of this 
that we need to do, we collectively need to do a better job about, and then also making sure that people are prepared. So from an education perspective, right, once someone is aware and they know, then how do we make sure that they have the, you know, they have the degree or they have the certification, right? They have the, they have the training um, and the knowledge so that they can be part of, this, part of this enterprise and contribute in that kind of way. We have one question over here. Space tourism is expected to be a potentially very profitable but very expensive industry. Uh, and considering the general demographics of those able to afford a half million dollar tip, uh, ticket, typically skewed to white older males, where does DE&I kind of go in terms of space tourism outside of uh, GoFundMe's crowdsourcing and, and winning contests? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I, I obviously, uh, we need people like Jared in the, we need the people who do have the money to be active allies in that space. Jared is an, an excellent example of that. Um, here's a person, um, white male, um, very successful in business, specifically chose, made a choice not to fly his buddies. He could have flown anybody. Instead, he was like, you know, he took one seat, the leadership seat, and there was four pillars. Um, leadership was him, and then the other one was hope, generosity, and prosperity. And he said, I'm going to go to space with people I don't know. Talk about taking a chance. But he was like, this is historic. This is first. I'm going to make an impact. And I'm not only going to do take three people that I don't know to space for three days. Think about that, right? Um, and two of us won contests, like you were saying. So you don't know who you're going to get, but he was willing to take that chance. And at the same time say, and, and then he said, not only am I gonna do that, but I wanna fly a childhood cancer survivor and I wanna raise $200 million for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So yeah, right? That, that's, that, that's saying something. But, but when you're talking about you know, the people who, who have the, the power and the money and the influence, how do we influence them to have those, to create that Jedi space? Um, but when you look at something like commercial space, uh, you, you can look at all of the missions that have flown, even like the blue, at least in every single commercial space, except for Axiom, every single one, every blue flight that I know of, Virgin Galactic, and Inspiration4 has somebody who was either gifted or won a seat to space. Every single one of them. And, and, and you look at that and you think, wow. I mean, Wally Funk, right? Even people who, who have influence like William Shatner, but still, I mean, he, he became the oldest person to fly to space and, and came back changed. And now is a champion for Earth because of the overview effect. Um, and, and those are the things that we want. And so I think that um, it's up to us to continue to say space for humanity. Uh, sent the first um, uh, Mexican-born female to space and the first uh, woman from Africa and the first Arab woman and the first Egyptian. She was all rolled into one, uh, Sara Sabre, to space. And, you know, and you say winning these contests, but if you can think about the fact that all of these missions have somebody who would not normally be able to go on that flight, we're making progress. That's something to, to say we want more of this. And, and, and that, that's what makes me excited. Even crypto, crypto community and, and DAOs are sending people to space. Like, who would have thought that, right? But that's what's happening, and that's exciting. And, and I think that we just got to keep saying we, 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 as a community, not just want, but we demand this to be the future because we want Jedi space. And knowing that people like all of you women are involved in the space sector, makes me feel like our future is pretty bright. So thank you so much for an insightful conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did.